uh, the, the, the little resources that they get from pension, pension funds uh, to, 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 to buy a, a, a drum to the amount of 20 rand upwards. Uh, the area, also the area like Elans, Warrens, and, and New, New Stands, Golovane, Muteti, and, and Tambo have, have no water reticulation, but it's almost six months without bulk, bulk supply. The district municipality did not bother to, to put temporary measures at all. Areas like Vezinyao in, in Pele, uh, next to California, along the dusty road of H Spane, uh, the entire village is dry, no water regulation. This is, this is just to, to say, Chairperson, that there's no seriousness here about, about uh, uh, keeping uh, the spread of of, 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 of the coronavirus virus. So, so, so our people are susceptible to this virus because of the unwillingness and, 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 the, and the lack of, 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 of communication and lack of, of presence in terms of leadership and to, 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 to provide leadership there. Uh, one of the problems, uh, Chairperson, that you encounter in a in a rural province uh, is the fact that you are in a rural province there are farms now uh, when you have farms you have farmers right and then you have the community and then you have COVID-19 and then uh, you have the, the, the requirement uh, along along that uh, coupled with the regulations uh, now People do not, do not, will not be able to adhere to the regulations of COVID-19 when they do not have, when they, they are denied their, 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 their uh, basic human rights. Uh, I'm saying this, uh, Chairperson, because in, 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 uh, in, 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 in Mr. 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 Venal and Rico uh, uh, Viterse, who are alleged to have been violating human rights uh, in depriving the community of water, electricity, and healthcare. When, the, when our EFF councillor goes there to, 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 to speak conscience to, 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 the, to the municipality, the municip when the municipality is trying to intervene, the, 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 the two individuals actually deny the community the rights that are, in, that are enshrined in the, in the, in the Constitution, in Section 27 of the constitution they they they, they just uh, deny them at all and this is this is prevalent Jefferson. i also work in a uh, am deployed in a in a rural uh, municipality of emakazin this i deal with it every day it's prevalent and it's something that the province uh, must must it's a cause for concern and it's something that the province must must sit down and and, and resolve uh, in terms of uh, um, uh, 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 legislation and and and, and as legislatures uh, uh, in, in, to 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 resolve that that problem. Uh, the, the the other one, let Chairperson, I will come back to 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 the other issue in the second bite, Chairperson. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Honourable Leza, Honourable Mpumza. Can you unmute your microphone, and Honorable? Is I still on mute? Hello, Chair. Yes, proceed. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, Chair, let's welcome the presentation by the Honorable MEC. Can and, you put uh, your camera on, Honorable Mpumza? Thank you. Chair. Let, let me... Oh, Jesus Christ. Honorable Mpumza. Chair? Yes. Yeah, I am. Yes, Chair. Where's your am I now? Now is my system on? 
the camera is not on. Bible. Yeah, I'm trying hard chair, to actually put my camera on. Seemingly, my system is uh, struggling me. Proceed then. Proceed. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Am I okay now? <clears throat> yes. Thanks, thanks, Chair Person. I was saying, Chair, uh, thank you very much. First and foremost, Chair, let me once again processly uh, apologize for disrupting the MEC. It was not intentional. And your committee chair. I profusely upfront apologize for that. I hope that uh, next time that won't happen. Chair, let me welcome the presentation uh, by the MEC of their provincial COVID plan, uh, COVID 19 uh, response plan. Um, chair, indeed, uh, uh, cardinally to a positive response, uh, to a positive response plan is uh, tracing, uh, testing, and isolation, of which indeed the province, I think, has uh, performed well, in that it has uh, actually achieved a 78% uh, 78 targeting and screening uh, of its population. However, Chair, the, the Procurement of uh, PPEs has to some extent uh, blighted the integrity of uh, departments and as well as state owned uh, institutions. Uh, in that, uh, the service providers that they hire to supply the PPPs. What we want to understand is that uh, service providers that had been hired to supply PPEs uh, within the health protocol. Because through the media, we have realized that uh, in some provinces, uh, some of these service providers were not within the health protocol, we find that there were service providers that were from mining, from communication, but they were not within the health sector, but now being uh, allowed to procure uh, PPEs. In this instance, can we be assured as this committee that uh, the service providers that have been engaged by the province were within the health sector? And uh, indeed, the procurement of the PPEs in the Limpompo province was a clean exercise. Uh, we will not, going forward in the future, perhaps uh, begin to see uh, some issues of uh, uh, corrupt related activities arising. That would be my first question, Chair. Similar to also the food parcel distribution has also dented uh, the trust of the citizens in government in that uh, the way it has been handled to some extent has again uh, raised a cause for concern. Are we as the province uh, in the Limpompo also, we can assure this committee that our district food bank vendors are watertight without any ill-gotten intentions uh, in relation to the distribution of food parcels to the needy and the destitute. Chairperson, COVID-19 has also exposed a number of fault lines in our service delivery trajectory and uh, as well as the existence of a uh, huge inequalities in our society. The MEC has related to indicate that almost about 449 uh, people in the Limpompo are homeless. And this is a challenge was that our transformation agenda 
uh, how speedy and committed are we to ensure that going forward, uh, the question of homelessness uh, would be a matter of the past that a shelter through human settlement would be provided to the needy and is a matter that would have to be prioritized. Again, in the presentation, there's an indication that uh, almost over 553 schools have been without water. But so far, the presentation indicates that uh, only 484 water tanks have been provided. What is happening to the difference number of the schools out of that 543? What is the position in this area of uh, COVID that we require water so that we comply with the proto health protocol of uh, washing our hands 20 times a day. What would be happening in those schools then where we begin to see that uh, water is still a matter that has those schools do not have access to? Chairperson uh, and members, The MEC in his presentation around education has indicated some financial pressures related to the fact that they had to provide staffing to, as a concession to a number of uh, employees who are living with comorbidities who could not be part uh, percent of the school. But in this presentation, where he indicates some financial pressures, uh, there is no quantification as to say how much was the number of such uh, staffing that is required, as well as how it, wh what would be the cost of procuring such a, a staff to ensure that indeed we are ready with the opening of schools. May I at the moment, Chair, uh, stop there. I think I'll come back. I still have more questions. Thanks, Chair. Okay, Honorable Director. Honorable Director, could you can you mute your mic, please? Thank you, Chairperson. Um, let me acknowledge the report that has been presented by the MEC. Uh, question: I only, uh, Chairperson, I only have a few questions. The first one is that: uh, What is it that the province is doing? in order to deal with the increasing infection of COVID on the healthcare workers. Do they have a necessary PPEs in place? And are they also uh, ad uh, adhering to the COVID uh, 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 legislation? Uh, chair number two is on the low cost housing project, the zinc houses that were launched by the by premier. They have painted a very bad image of the province. Even when you go to the social medias or any media platform, you could see that they have done a lot of damage for the province. So what is it that they are planning to do in order to deal with that uh, negative publicity that they had due to those uh, zinc houses? And secondly, is there staff in the premier's office? And what is their role and responsibility? The reason why I'm asking this is because on the other newspaper, there, were, there was an interview where the premier said he was not aware of what he was going to launch. So the question is, if he was not aware, what was the role of the staff? Are they not supposed to have people in the office who will monitor the pro uh, any project that the, 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 the premier is going to launch or the premier is going to do? Because it's a disgrace that the premier will just go uh, and launch mikukus for our people. It's really painted a very p a bad picture. It's, it's also created impression that you don't care for our people. And uh, Chair, lastly, uh, there are allegations of corruption in terms of the COVID uh, procurement. So on Limpopo, I just want to check what is it that the, pro uh, the, pro uh, the, the, the province is doing in order to deal away with the uh, allegation. And, uh, and also, if is it possible that we can get a list of the, uh, the, the procurement that has been done, the process that has been followed, and the amount that has been spent so far? Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Honorable Direko.
I think for now I've exhausted my speakers list. Uh, the issues that I personally want to raise uh, is in relation to how municipalities are going to be supported to come up with post-COVID recovery plans to expedite economic recovery. I'm raising this because uh, one of the damages caused by the pandemic is unemployment and the municipalities are the engine rooms of the economy. So I don't see any way in the presentation that has to deal with that. Then the other issues that I wanted to raise is regarding slide uh, 64 of the presentation. The first and second, the first and second batches of the cloth face mask were roughly similar in quantity. If you check in that slide, the other ones were 500,000 and the other ones were 570,000. So the issue here that we want to, want to raise, it's, and then if you check that, and the delivery dates were not too far apart from each other. Uh, the other one was delivered on the 29th of May. The other one was delivered on the 2nd of, Ju uh, uh, 2nd of June. So the issues that one wants to raise here, you check the cost difference between the two batches. It is approximately 5 million uh, in that the the 13.9 million for the first batch and 8 million for the second batch. So the question that one wants to ask here is that what accounts for this enormous cost difference? Can you go to slide 66? Uh, slide 66, if you go, I'm quickly going to eat the something that I picked it up there. Yes, slide 66, it's with regard to the Provincial uh, Department of Education, where in the department is lamenting uh, the financial implication of having to provide water to schools as the agreement between basic education, water and sanitation and rainwater has expired. Then the question that I want to ask the Honorable MEC is this. Who was responsible for the water provisioning services in schools before the signing of the agreement between the Department of Basic Education, Water and Sanitation and Rainwater? Then the other issue that one wants to raise is with reference to the provision of chemical toilets for learners by Mvoda Trust, as indicated in slide 69. Uh, the question that arises here is what are the details in terms of place, quantity, and price? Who was responsible for the provisioning costs? Then the other issues it's in relation to the disaster management uh, center as well. Uh, you, you, you said, MEC, that uh, uh, we we'll recall on 6 May, there was a report that a uh, cocktail has given municipalities a total amount of 14.5 million for PPEs and hygiene pets. The ex expenditure to date with regard to municipalities, in particular in Limpopo, is 149,000. And you've said that earlier in a presentation, MEC Makam. The question that comes, why is this? And... What is COPTA doing to remedy this challenge? Because if you check the national report, uh, other provinces have been faring so well. And then we want you, MEC Makamu, to give us time frames by which all municipalities will reach 100% verifiable spending. The money has not been spent according to COPTA national report. Then the other issue that I want to raise that is related to yourself, MEC, as it relates to the, the Disaster Management Act, is that what is the risk posed by illegal crossing of the borderline? And how do you contribute to mitigating this to ensure that COVID-19 containment for communities along the border, uh, in Vembe in particular? 
then the other issue coming back to them. If you will look at your presentation, remember this municipality has the lowest cases in the province, implying that there's a need to work hard to keep it that way. There's also a need for practical measures to ensure that it remains as it is and that the future opening of borders does not lead to a surge in the area. So the question that I want, want to raise with you as the province, what is your differentiated approach and whether there is expressed and whether that is expressed in the district development development model plan? And then when you go to Skukune and Capricorn, they are the highest in the province. Are these practical and verifiable community-based measures being uh, implemented in relation to the to these two districts? So then the other issue that is this is the last one. Uh, it's in relation to the Department of Health. Will the Department of Health consider developing a disaster managing management plan in line with Section 38 of the Disaster Management Act and Coxter? a robust provincial uh, multi-hazard disaster management plan, which you must lead as coaster of the entire province to deal proactively with future disasters like this one. And then uh, we want to also understand what are the arrangements in relation to this one. And then uh, which other departments have you identified to start developing plans and building disaster management capacity and the time frames for that? And then the other issue that I would also like to hear from you, uh, MEC Makam, is that uh, which municipalities included COVID-19 resilience building in the IDPs? And uh, was there a budget provided for this? So basically, this is my first batch of questions that then I can hand over to you, MEC Makam and team. You will allocate your response to what in line with uh, what the other members have raised as well. Over to you, MEC Makamu. Thanks. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, uh, apologies for the echo. I think the questions will be talking to number of uh, sectors or departments. Uh, maybe I should uh, first take the allow the MEC for health to deal with the questions that were raised by Honorable Hussein. Uh, she will deal with those ones. Then I will allow the MEC for education to come in and deal with the questions. And then MEC Squatty will come and talk about the allegation of the uh, PPEs. Then after MEC Rakwale will handle the issue of the integrity in terms of the food distribution and uh, work in the district food banks. Then I will come back and deal with the questions which talks about Talani or the human settlement programs and the COCTA programs. We will be dealing with those ones. The DG can deal with the issue of the staff in the premier's office if they're there. But I think, uh, DG, the question uh, of the communication uh, in terms of how the Talani project was, I will handle it. MEC for health? Yes. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, good evening to honorable members and evening to 
my colleagues in the Executive Council, uh, the DG of the province and uh, uh, DG National and all the officials and support staff who have joined us. I think there the, the has been a personal question that has been asked. While a provincial treasury, I think I think the MEC for Treasury will will unpack on the issues of P, PPE's procurement. Uh, I think the honourable member probably have read the Sunday Independent article with, with the headlines of 932 million on PPEs, and and I think honourable member would have seen the presentation uh, by our presentation, which is very clear that the provincial government have spent up to so far 668 million. Therefore, logic will dictate and basic arithmetic that there is no way one department can spend 932 million while the entire province has only spent uh, 668 million. And that 668 million is for all uh, COVID related matters. And uh, therefore, it's not even for PPEs alone. If you break it down to PPEs alone, you'll find it very low. And that, that slide also indicated that for COVID-related matters in health, it mm -hmm. expenditures at 5.5. And I think the the uh, uh, MEC, our lead, leader of our delegation, MEC Makamu, has also indicated that the head of department in health has gone at length yesterday to try to clarify this issue. Now, the honorable member has written, as has asked a question which I'm still trying to understand because I have not seen that allegation that uh, I, I am linked to an, an awarding of a 9 million tender to a daughter of a former executive mayor who is my friend. I therefore would request uh, through you, Chairperson, if the question can be sent to me in writing, uh, so that I, I'm clear on that, because uh, if the honorable member is referring to the very same article I'm talking about, where there is an allegation that I am a friend to a former colleague of mine who served in the same executive council together uh, because we happen to have been having a picture together in an official uh, gathering of a heritage day, which she was an MEC responsible for sports, arts, and culture. And we happen to take pictures, like I will do to any of you comrades who are here, uh, those who are my comrades, including your, the, your chair, our chairperson of the portfolio committee, who is my leader and whom I do meet in official gatherings. And while we are on duty, we can take pictures. So you can't conclude friendship based on the picture. Honorable member, you ask a question, whether I have family members who have benefited, you're welcome to come and do any investigation. All these articles that you read and allegations, not even a single one of them talk about either any of my siblings or any of my close relative or spouse or anyone who has benefited from this. And if you do have any, you're welcome to bring it up. But I needed to clarify that, to say, look, sometimes we should not be reading things that are not existing. Uh, because the way you have been presenting now, it's even uh, completely distorted of even the article that was also distorted. So, so I needed to clarify that personal uh, question that Honorable Member has, has asked. And just further on to say any other question that has to deal with the awarding of contracts as an executive uh, authority, you will know that PFMA does not even allow me to enter into that space. And I'm, I'm requesting that 9 million question to be done in writing so that I can take it to my administrator to be able to investigate and be able to check if there's any company, because I wouldn't even know uh, if that has happened, because that is not my space. Let me come to my space, honorable members, where I am responsible and where I'm directly accountable. The honorable members ask a question. Who are 
uh, getting infected? Do we have necessary PPEs? Honorable members, I must indicate that as a province, we have never compromised in terms of the quality of our PPEs and the availability of our PPEs. We we'll always make sure that at least in our pharmaceutical depot, there should be a three month buffer stock to be able to protect our PPEs, our, our health care workers, whom in our province we don't refer them as frontliners, but however, we refer them to them as our last line of defense. We also would like to remind also uh, honorable members that we are one of the province that started uh, uh, to after the president has pronounced on the mass household screening and testing. Unfortunately, we started on the 14th of April when other provinces started early because we couldn't until we were sure of the PPEs. We couldn't release our 10,000 cadres to the communities when we were not, when because we were struggling to get sanitizers at that time. We couldn't get them anywhere during that time. We were also struggling to get face, face, uh, face masks, if you remember, because th there was a, a, a general a scarcity of such uh, items in the country. Now, we have been able to screen and not even have any of our response team having been infected because we were very strict in that. So how are we making sure that our healthcare workers are protected? The first thing is on making sure that the PPEs are available at all times. As a province, we've also adopted. Yeah. We, we have a... Honorable Keza, sorry, I'm missing. Oh. Honorable Keza. Hello, yes. can you hear me? Yes. Sorry, sorry. As a, as a province, yes, I, I thank you. you. As a province, can, can you, am I audible now? Yes, you are. You are. Proceed, I'm Yes. Uh, Chairperson, as a province, we adopted a policy which but has been approved and authorized even by the accounting officer that there is no single healthcare worker who is allowed to touch a patient unless they are in full PPEs and relevant to the area they are operating. Meaning if you are a security personnel, you should be able to be wearing your mask and relevant PPEs at that uh, station you are. And as we move to our casualty, to our screening, area we make sure that we do that while we have recorded yes my an increased number of health workers my apologies yes. can i talk to the colleagues who are on the control of the meeting why are you showing us notes of somebody instead of uh, showing us the mec can we attend to that uh, admin because we should be seeing yes Thank you. Proceed, MEC. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, I was indicating to say, uh, while yes, we have, we are seeing, we recorded an increased number of healthcare workers uh, testing positive. Uh, we have also seen uh, one of the highest recovery rate because in terms of our public service employees, you will notice that we have never recorded any death, either it's a doctor, a nurse, or a cleaner, or any any healthcare worker in our province due to COVID related. So that shows you that we are very serious in terms of making sure that we protect our frontliners who are our last line of defense. Yes, regrettable, we have lost three doctors who are working independently as a private as private uh, in private sector because. To us as a province, we don't have the Department of Private Health or Public Health. And we have, we have since used this as an opportunity to strengthen our training capacity, which we have been, we have, what we have done in our uh, public service uh, healthcare workers, training them on how to put uh, PPEs properly and how to treat each and every person, whether it's your patient or not, or your colleague as COVID positive. We need to strengthen that uh, training and also be able to do 
inspection on the availability of PPEs within even the doctors that are working in the independent practice. That we are doing it because a loss of a doctor or a nurse, it doesn't matter which sector you are working in, it is remaining the sector, it's remaining South African healthcare system that is dealt a blow. So that work, honorable member, we are doing it and we are providing support and training. We have also indicated uh, in our province uh, that we are going to, we have closed down our tea rooms because that's an area where we've seen an, a lot of infection happening because uh, when in our nature of work, after being stressed, we go to the tea room where we need to debrief each other. And in the process of debriefing, we become relaxed and think because it's my colleague, they might not be uh, positive. And then we, we uh, unfortunately get infected. Uh, on, on Honorable Chair, in terms of the current uh, infect, infection rate, I think uh, the, the, yes, we are as a province have started to do uh, the work anticipation of level two uh, lockdown. We have started to put up proactive measures, say how do we then make sure that we still remain uh, at lower levels of infection. We, we, you will be seeing in the coming weeks as we'll be rolling out our strategy, even our communication strategies, uh, that start to speak to the fact that moving to level two, it's not necessary because uh, the we have got a vaccine or the storm is over. It's because, of course, we need uh, our economy. It's, it's in trouble now. We have got it to continue uh, with uh, our work and also open the economy uh, in its uh, full capacity. But we, we are saying we have got now as health to look at all the three le levels of uh, healthcare promotion that begin to speak uh, to the primary level, wherein uh, now that we don't have a vaccine, but the messaging, because usually when we talk of the three a level of promotion at level uh, one of a primary healthcare, you, you also consider vaccine. So we'll be doing that and be able to do the screening also uh, in our community. What we are, we are saying, Chairperson, said, is that we will be strengthening our community uh, household approach, which we uh, launch when we were approaching the surge. Right now, what we're going to be doing is to continue to be empowering our people, especially the vulnerable, to say as we move to level two, everybody will be out there getting infected, coming home to infect the vulnerable and the elderly who might not uh, survive. So in order to prevent the death and the mortality rate, the other household uh, infection uh, control where we teach them how to properly clean a house, the other household quarantine, where we teach them to say, how do you stay indoor and how do you protect yourself? Staying with somebody who might be positive and not even knowing that they are positive, but not getting infected. That's the work that we are currently putting all our efforts on, focusing on those. And the advantage is that the bulk of Limpopo, it's rural, where when you look at uh, the way we, we are staying, most of us do not stay in one single house. You might find that in a yard we've got three to four house. So we, we, we are going back to the basics where we, we are saying, Chairperson, uh, I've, I've always used an example that after a pregnant woman has delivered in the house in our olden days, she will not allow to be seen and the baby will not be seen by any other person, including the father of the child, because we fear that you are going to infect that child because the immune system is very weak. But when the child has got chicken pox, what would be done is that the child will be told to go and play with other children and infect them. When the child has measles, the child will not be allowed to play with other children because they knew if a child has got in, in, in measles, there was no cure for, for measles. So that strategy, we are using it to say, those who are vulnerable, 
whom we know that the immune system will not survive the virus, they must stay at home. And our model now is going to be incorporated to social development and COXTA, where we are saying we have done, currently we finished the household a profiling. Those who are vulnerable, who are receiving grants, we are busy now starting uh, to say we'll be negotiating to find together with COXTA and using the CDW and also our uh, uh, SASA, how do we then support them to get the, their grants as the infections will be increasing now that we are moving to level two. So that way if we do it, it will make sure that we keep the levels low and those who are out there who get infected will be the ones who get a, a chicken pox, which we know it's just you will develop herd immunity. It will not necessarily kill you. But those whom we know will get measles, which might kill them, we will not allow them to go out. So that is the strategy that we are currently using now that we are at that stage of, of uh, being, being worried that the numbers will increase. But that, yeah, the the, the question that has been asked in terms of Sikukune uh, being our, uh, 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 what, what do you call our epicenter? We want to indicate to say to the, to the, the updated report, Sikukune is no longer our epicenter. As we relax the level to four and three, yes, Sikukune, the mine uh, became our hotspot. That's why why we, the premier went there to launch our community uh, household uh, approach to the search, where we have been able to screen and test people residing in the community and the villages where the mines are uh, located. And we have been able to pick up a fewer who, were, who have been able to be positive and we've been able to cap the spread. That is why today Skukune is number three chairperson. It's number three because our approach to dealing with uh, the mines was very decisive. We, we, we even had to be at loggerheads with the mine, most of the mining company until uh, the time where we both agreed that if, if they don't do what we're advising, we'll find ourselves in trouble. Today we are saying uh, our mine workers, we have, we have lost few of them to, to COVID-19. Our infection rate, it's lower than if you look at other provinces, which has got mines, but with lower percentage of minerals uh, compared to Limpop. We started to be the province that was going to be the epicenter in terms of mining area. But because of uh, the strategy that we develop and the approach that we developed towards the mine, it was able to, to rescue and, and, and assist us. So Capricorn District is the one that is leading at a cumulative cases of 3,759. But having said that, we must understand that Capricorn is our, uh, cap with our capital city, I would say it, or where Polokwane is. And that's why it's understandable because that's where the economic activities in our province is. That's where movement is uh, because this virus does not move. It's us who, who, who transport it. It's followed by Waterberg District and then Skukune will be number three and, and that's it. So, the question of Bambesti, yes, is the last one. I've already responded to say, in terms of addressing the issues of uh, a Bambe, uh, how to make sure that we remain. We are this this approach that we have. Uh, we have even been to Bambe to launch how and train the ordinary people uh, how to uh, clean your surface in a manner which you you definitely will prevent. Uh, yourself being infected. And I think uh, uh, I, I have uh, tried to cover uh, uh, all the questions that have been uh, asked. MEC? Chairperson, it's Hussein, yeah. Honorable Hussein? I'm sorry to interrupt. I, I didn't want to interrupt the MEC earlier on, but uh, I'm afraid she hasn't answered all of the questions, Chair. I asked a very direct question about whether or not she had personally benefited. She referred to family members. And I'm sorry, MEC, with respect, asking me to come and investigate you. I don't have time for that nonsense, really. I mean, I think that's what you have said is just completely disrespectful. You are the political head. You should be 
you should expect that when you come before a portfolio committee that we as a portfolio committee is going are going to ask you tough questions and hold you accountable that's your job i'm sorry if you don't like it and i'm sorry if you're not used to it but i hope you get used to it every time you come before this portfolio committee because you are accountable to the people of south africa you can't ask the people to come investigate you if there are allegations against you we expect you to give decent answers so i want to ask you have you personally benefited from this you are aware of allegations also in your own home province that you personally benefited there are allegations that family members of yours have houses that have been bought with cash that you had assisted these are allegations i'm not saying that they are true but they are in the public domain and you have a responsibility to address them and the best way to address them is to be open and honest and put it out and give us your response and i'll take you on I take your word for it, but for you for you to respond in the arrogant manner in which you did, I'm afraid it's just really not acceptable. I asked you whether or not you will be willing to open yourself up for a lifestyle audit. You failed. You you didn't even answer that question. You avoided it, and I raised it twice. So if you have not personally benefited from that, I'm sure you wouldn't have a problem with you being subjected to a lifestyle audit. And I'd like to hear what your response to that is. have you also asked for officials in your department to be investigated this is not a minor matter this involves 600 million rand and i i i get your response about the 932 million versus the 600 million i cleared that up i understand that but if 600 million rand to you seems a small amount of money to the people in your province i'm sorry it's a lot of money especially when you look at the poverty levels in in your province So you have a responsibility to res- respond to these things in a manner that I think that is befitting of your office, and I will appreciate if you will please give us a decent answer. Thank you very much, Chair. Okay, let me see. With regard to the yes, before that, before that, there's a matter that I also ask about the two highest uh, regions. The question was whether there are practical and verifiable community-based measures that have been implemented with regard to these uh, two regions that have got the highest infection. We will deal with that as we also deal with the issues raised by Honorable Lusten. Before I proceed to the next MSP. Hey, uh, can, can, can you repeat your, your question so that I don't mix it again? With regard to Capricorn and Waterbeck, they, you are saying they are the okay. highest in the province. And then the question was all about whether there are practical and verifiable community-based measures that are being implemented currently with regard to the two uh, 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 regions, as they are the highest ones in terms of infections. Uh, th- thank you chair for that uh, honorable hussein my apology if you thought i did not answer uh, your question and you thought i was rude uh, i'm not rude in my nature i just have a very strong voice i want to clearly and and, and state it categorically here to say i have never benefited from any single a tender that has been awarded neither any of my immediate family or either it's any of my children who are even under age neither any of my siblings or or my spouse or anyone that is close to me i have not i further on explain to say the allegation that is being referred to it's somebody who is not even my friend but a former colleague of mine like i have so many former colleagues that i would have pictures with and the allegations that uh, i have brothers and sisters who have bought houses i'm saying i don't i'm hearing it for the first time because it has not been brought to me i would appreciate uh, that if indeed there is evidence to that uh, effect it can also uh, be uh, sub- uh, subjected to those uh, 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 
structures and, and, and institutions that are empowered by the law to can investigate. In simple language, I'm saying I have not bought any houses through my family members. You can go and to the deeds. I, I'm, I'm, I'm reassuring you and check for that. I, I hope now I've answered that. This, the second uh, question, uh, uh, Chair, that you are, you are, I'm, you are I'm asking. Sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you, uh, MSC. Thank you very much. Uh, Chair, with your permission, you may I proceed? I just want to. Uh, uh, can can you note it as a follow-up, Honorable Lucent? All right, I, I will sort I'll give so you first you. preference when we uh, thank, go to the second you. round question. Just note whatever you are you wanting to have, so for the sake of progress, so that thank we you. also allow other MECs to to respond to the issues. So can you finish with the respond with, with regard to my question, Honorable MEC? Oh. No, no, thanks, Chair. I think the, the, the maybe Honorable Hussein also has asked if I'm willing to be subjected to lifestyle audit. I am any time of the day. I am willing to can be subjected to that. Uh, the, 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 the questions that you have asked, uh, Chairperson, uh, what I indicated was that, yes, in, in when we launch the community-based approach after we saw a surge within the mining area, it did not end in Skukun. We move to Mubani and also to Waterbeck and then make sure that it's also here in, in Capricorn and also in, in, in a Bembe district. So all our districts currently, what we are doing this, this, the, the, the community or the household approach, uh, it's being implemented in all uh, our, our, our regions. All of the districts are practicing uh, this particular uh, approach that we have launched. So, so we believe that, uh, yes, even if uh, 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 what, uh, Capricorn has got more cases, uh, those cases are still at a level where we can we are managing them because we are saying as a province if if you remember the slide that MEC Makamu has been showing this is a slide that shows that we are still at less than one percent as a province and we are at that and and we think even if the the numbers are increasing what encourages us is that when you look at the numbers new cases. Uh, recorded within 24 hours, and uh, the number of uh, 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 patients who are recovering, you'll find that the recovery rate is it's very high. So that is why we are comfortable to say where we are, uh, we are able to deal with the virus. And even, even the question that you asked earlier on to say, uh, now that you have advertised posts and you are not getting a special, the specialist, currently we are still comfortable with the specialist that we have. The problem will be if, if the numbers continue to increase. Uh, but currently, the reason why we're not feeling some of these posts is because the medical specialists and those medical doctors are not there within the market. Those ICU nurses are not there with the market, in the, within the market. But the enrolled nurses and the uh, enrolled nursing assistant, the processes of shortlisting and interviewing, it's ongoing. But as it is for now, we have not reached an era where in our staff is not able to deal with uh, the current infection rate. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, MEC. MEC Wishiela. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson, and good evening to our colleagues and everybody. Uh, Chair, let me start with the question of saying what is the difference uh, between the mask that you ask, Chair. I must say that, remember, the firstly, grade 7 and 12 were supposed to come back on the 1st of June. And because we were not ready at that time, we had to move them to come uh, on the 8th of June. So by that time, we have bought for our grade uh, 7 and 12, which uh, grade 12 was 79,903, 
and grade seven was 125, 759. And as you know, we, we have to give uh, each learner two masks uh, uh, each. And also even the teachers, we had to give them uh, two masks each. And by that time we were preparing for other grades to also come in because the other grades that were coming in July was grade 11 and six, and we had already put in orders. That is why you see them, uh, the space is too short. In terms of uh, the water, we said 523 uh, the, uh, schools need water and 484 tanks have been delivered. The remaining one, which is 39, they are busy with it because the other grades are coming on Monday. As of now, what we have at schools is enough for now, but we are busy making sure that by Monday we have all of them. In terms of the pressures, the financial pressures because of comorbidities, we indicated that uh, 1,914 have been given concession and the amount uh, of money that we would need in order to, to substitute them is 331 million. In terms of uh, water provision, uh, you know in Limpopo we have 515 uh, pit latrines or schools with not proper sanitation. The 300 are going to be done by Department of Basic Education through the presidential infrastructure. And as the province, uh, we are left with 215. The Department of Basic Education have delivered uh, toilets to 453 and is their cost uh, and their money. The budget is not coming from the province. Uh, from Limpopo, we have uh, provided for the remaining toilets and the budget is 1.4 million rent. And uh, I am not sure, uh, Chair, if I'm missing any other question, but I think it's the questions that I've noted. Thank you, Chair. MEC Sikwati. And Mrs. Kwati? Yes, uh, it's actually late in the evening, Chair, so uh, I'm uh, a little bit close there, I suspect. But uh, let me get my gadget proper. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Chairperson and uh, members of the Portfolio Committee, uh, my colleagues uh, who are uh, in this meeting. Let me say, uh, Chair, that first and foremost, uh, we take uh, the allegations uh, that they have been uh, going or making rounds, uh, particularly in the province, very, very serious. And uh, we are in a process of trying to make sure that uh, we are able to ensure that uh, everything that is being done is transparent, but as well there is a, a fairness in terms of how we deal with uh, uh, these matters. Now, we we have uh, already, um, like all other provinces, compiled a list of all those uh, service providers uh, who, who actually participated in the procurement process. And we have then uh, um, looked at uh, all those processes in terms of uh, the administrative compliance and so on. And we have also um, um, made it a point that uh, the AG is also um, uh, auditing those uh, 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 service providers. But, but equally, the SIU, as we are speaking, is already uh, on board in terms of uh, investigating some of the, all the allegations that uh, have been purported that uh, certain uh, things might have taken place. And therefore, we believe that if we are able to subject uh, this uh, um, process to scrutiny, but also allow those that uh, are actually uh, um, more, um, you know, capacitated to deal with the investigations. That should be able to assist us to deal with uh, these issues in a more organized uh, fashion, because as we speak now, there are a lot of uh, allegations, you know, coming from all quarters. And Unfortunately, if we don't uh, subject them to uh, uh, those that have got the capacity to investigate, um, it might not, uh, even after having investigated, you might still find that uh, 
because we have as said certain things that we are not able to ultimately um, verify. It uh, then still remains a problem in terms of uh, the public out there. But I thought because the SIU is already on board and is investigating all those, those allegations, giving us a sense of uh, comfort that uh, indeed there is nothing that uh, we are going to sweep under the carpet. Everything that is going to be done is going to be done in a transparent manner. But as well, if there is any wrongdoing, we believe that uh, whoever is... Uh, committed that should actually be uh, held accountable. Thanks, uh, uh, Chair. To MEC Scott. MEC Rahwan. Thank you so much and good evening uh, to the chairperson of the portfolio committee, members of the committee, our colleagues in the province, my colleagues in the province, and our administration led by the DG of the province and the DG national. Ms. Rahwal, is it you when I was asking, identify yourself with this guy? You know, th there was a time when I, I attempted to speak to a person. I wanted to indicate that it seems as if it's me because I kept on being cut from the system quite some a uh, number mm. of times, but I think it's sorted now. Because to me, it shows that it just got a name, so it means it doesn't have a name from that side of the system. Okay. My apologies, sir, uh, person. Mm. Thank you so much. I think there was a question regarding uh, perhaps the system. Oh, yeah. South Africans want to guess? see your face. Oh, yeah. South Africans want to see your face, too. <laughs> it's okay. My Instead apologies. I'm seeing the eight years. Okay. Thank, thank you so much. I think I'm, I'm, I must indicate that uh, as a Department of Social Development in Mpopo, uh, as a way of keeping or preventing malicious in, uh, in, intent in terms of uh, food parcel distribution. I must indicate that we, in collaboration with municipalities and traditional leaders, we, we had uh, established some kind of a task team that was assisting us as a department in terms of identification, because I think at the level of identification, that's where the challenges were. And, and social workers were coming in in terms of verifying the, 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 whether those that are were receiving were the right uh, full uh, indeed uh, recipients. So it assisted us a lot as a department. So there, there, there was initially some kind of an outcry to say councillors are involved and they, they need not to be involved. And we made sure that we take out councillors in the system, especially at the level of identification and make sure that uh, they will then assist in terms of distribution because they are the ones that are at the what level and they're the ones that are able to help us in terms of where the food should be delivered. And I must indicate here, person, that uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a department, we were reporting uh, in the PCC, which was sitting every Wednesday, and making sure that the, the reports also start at the DCC, at a district level, where in, uh, our district directors were sitting and presenting such a report in the, in the DCC. So I must indicate that after such a system was um, established, a person who did not experience a lot of challenges. But safe to say, also moving, we moved forward to uh, making sure that we, we working with municipalities again, we established what we call district uh, food banks, wherein the, we were directing each and every donor that will say, I am from Mupani, I'll give an example, and I want to donate to a Mupani district. And therefore, the donor will then be directed to the food bank that is based in Mopani District Municipality to make sure that food will be distributed uh, from that level. Of course, there will, there will always be challenges when it comes to the issue of uh, food parcels, chairperson. But I think we tried our utmost uh, level best to make sure that we, we, we do not leave people that are hungry, that are not supposed to, to go hungry. I think in the main chairperson, unless there's a follow-up question, uh, that's what I can say, chairperson. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, MEC Rahwale. DG Nchaweli. DG Nchaweli. Uh, thanks, uh, Honorable Chair. I also want to pass greetings to the Honorable Members of the Committee uh, and the Honorable MECs and colleagues uh, whom are connected to these discussions. Uh, I was uh, tasked to respond to uh, two related issues uh, that I'll start off by making reference to them. Uh, the first one was 
uh, to check whether the premier was indeed well briefed uh, with regards to the Dalana project. And secondly, uh, 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 which is also linked to that question, on, on the capacity of the support staff, I'm, I'm narrowing it down to the support staff to the premier, uh, 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 within the office of the premier. And then thirdly, the, how do we then deal with the, the negative uh, publicity arising from the launch of this project? Uh, and then as a starting point, I would like to put it on record that uh, 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 the, 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 the Premier was uh, well briefed on the project uh, by the, the, the relevant department which is responsible, which was or actually the still responsible for this project, which is the uh, the, pro the Department of Cooperative Governance, Human Settlement, and Traditional Affairs. Uh, and the, the key challenge which arose was largely with regards to the way we have communicated uh, on this project uh, to the public, uh, in the sense that uh, normally when, when, when the Premier uh, is invited by a, a, a any stakeholder, including provincial departments, to launch a project or, an, a, a, or to attend a particular gathering, we request the department consent to submit the, the briefing notes to the premier so that uh, it, we use those briefing notes as a basis for uh, uh, developing a communications plan. And then uh, the, the, the briefing notes that we have received on this matter did not clearly distinguish uh, between the broader strategic objectives of the uh, program, which is part of the integrated human settlement, and the, and the short-term interventions that relate to COVID-19. Uh, the, the, in the sense that the, the broader project is to actually uh, uh, develop integrated human settlement, a project in that uh, area as a substitute to the current hostel due to a number of issues overcrowding, lack of service, proper services, etc., which is uh, uh, captured into the housing plan, the, the long-term housing plan of the department. But when this COVID-19 mute your microphone. We are hearing all your conversation from that side. DG, can you go a bit? Can't you go a bit up? We're only seeing your nose. Oh, all right. No, sorry for that. Yeah, you, thanks. You're only seeing your nose. Am I, I hope I'm now this. All right. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. That on okay. the, uh, as part of COVID-19 intervention, and then uh, fortunately the, the chairperson, the honorable chair during her opening remarks, she did acknowledge that this was a, a national uh, 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 initiative to deal with issues of uh, densification uh, in certain uh, informal settlements. Then uh, the, the, the Zanin project or Dagani project was actually, is actually part of those national initiatives. Uh, and then when we then uh, uh, issued a communication brief, that, 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 that distinction between phase, for the purpose of this discussion, between phase one and phase two were actually not clearly defined. And then after uh, this issue became a, 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 a national a crisis point uh, in the country, then we then went back to, uh, to, uh, to make an, a preliminary assessment as the office of the premier to say what, what could have gone wrong. And then that preliminary assessment, including the relevant department, which is Coxter, and then which then confirmed that indeed the challenge arose from the, the media brief uh, that, uh, uh, or, or the draft media brief that we received uh, from the department itself. And then on the basis of that, we therefore uh, requested uh, or the premier directed uh, the, the MEC and indirectly the HOD to actually do a proper investigation on this matter and submit a report accordingly. And then as, as, as an attempt to uh, 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 put the record to that, the DG has subsequently 
sub, uh, uh, wrote a letter to HOD for Coxter, and then they are busy finalizing the report, which will then clearly uh, indicate whether there, there was uh, uh, an element of uh, 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 dereliction of duty, and then if so, what would be the corrective uh, 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 actions to be taken thereof uh, against or in relation to the implicated officials. But then in, the, in terms of the broader issues of quality assurance uh, and value for money, et cetera, the, 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 the department which is of human settlement and HDA, which is a, a project manager, uh, uh, are busy finalizing the report on the matter and then will then be guided by the findings thereof. I think that, that's the point that I wanted to briefly elaborate on. And, uh, and this was indeed an unfortunate scenario because since the commencement of the COVID-19 uh, disaster declaration, the province has done relatively well communications-wise because in, 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 the first, in the first few meetings of the uh, provincial command council, one of the issues that they, they uh, considered and resolved on was the uh, 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 an adoption of the provincial uh, uh, communications plan with regards to COVID-19. Hence, our profile has actually been largely positive since the beginning of this uh, intervention till, un until recently with, due to the, this specific project. And then with regards to whether we have got adequate capacity in the office in terms of the support of the Premier, I would like to confirm that indeed we do have uh, adequate capacity. Uh, uh, both in, in, within, in terms of the private office or the office which is actually managed by the chief of staff uh, uh, and in, in supporting Premier on a daily basis. And we also have a protocols unit which actually monitors uh, a project uh, or, or rather the diary of Premier in terms of launching specific projects. But unfortunately, during COVID-19, as per the, the directives from the Minister of public service and administration, we were, we were expected to reduce the staff, the active staff in the office to 33%. And then part of that exercise, I think that part of that exercise led to a situation whereby staff that is dealing with uh, protocols and uh, services, um, uh, field work, monitoring of projects before the premier can pay a visit to such a project were actually uh, released and then they were, work, they were working from home. And, but uh, as I earlier alluded to, this, this was not the first project which the Premier has launched during COVID-19. And more, almost 99.9% .9 of all those visits went smoothly uh, because we are relying uh, primarily on the brief that we have received, we were receiving from the, the, the departments as the relevant custodians of those projects themselves. And then, but since then, we have now uh, uh, decided to reinforce our communications uh, unit and protocol services uh, uh, arising from this incident. And then as I speak, uh, now uh, tomorrow there is a, a provincial executive council meeting, uh, which amongst others, it is going to adopt the, uh, the provincial communication strategy for the sixth term of the administration. And then on that basis, we think that uh, we are relatively on the, on the right track. I think those are the key issues that uh, the honorable uh, members were. Oh, I think in conclusion, the issue of the, the allegation or the statement, the article which has issued by uh, uh, the media that the premier indicated that he didn't know about a project. Actually, that was a distortion. And in line with that, we have actually already submitted a, a formal com complaint to, uh, to the ombudsman uh, or the media ombudsman to actually uh, uh, make a determination on this matter. And we believe that uh, based on the record that we have, we believe that uh, uh, they will be obliged to uh, uh, rescind the, the, the pronouncement because the premier has also publicly indicated that he has never had any uh, telephonic or scheduled interview with the journalist who has actually published that uh, article. Uh, I think those are th those are the key issues that uh, were direct questions that needed clarity from the 
from the DG. But I think on oh, the last point, even though the MEC for Cox may, may elaborate on, is with regards to post-recovery economic strategy. I, will, I just want to assure the portfolio committee that uh, uh, we have already started with that exercise at two levels. One, uh, at the provincial level, uh, we, we, are, we are currently finalizing a review of the provincial growth and development strategy, which, which was supposed to give a, a, give a developmental trajectory for the whole province. And then on the basis of that, and then the, the first draft has already been finalized, and we believe that by, by the end of September, we'll have concluded the process. And that PGDS, uh, the reverse PGDS will then lay a basis for the review of the uh, municipal IDPs for, for the next financial year. And second, we are also finalizing the uh, uh, eco provincial economic recovery plan. Uh, the draft has been uh, finalized. We have consulted all the stakeholders, including labor and the private sector. The only reason that we could not process uh, this plan for ad an adoption by EXCO was that we will have to wait for cabinet to, fund, to release the, uh, the national economic recovery plan so that when we release our provincial uh, plan, it should be responsive to the, 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 the cabinet uh, uh, national plan. I think those are the key issues. And then on the basis of that, we, uh, we have also consulted municipalities and they are familiar with uh, our proposals on these issues. Then, uh, then upon the approval by EXCO, we we'll then make sure that the municipalities uh, uh, develop the review their LED strategies. And in addition to that, they also review the IDPs to be responsive to the overarching provincial plans. And then in terms of the institutional arrangements, uh, in addition to the fact that uh, municipalities are represented in the provincial command council, we are also uh, arranging the uh, uh, premier's IGR forum. Uh, the, the technical forum is actually scheduled for next week. Uh, and then in that, uh, in that forum, we are going to discuss, to take stock on how do we then consolidate on the work done by, uh, by the, the uh, COVID-19 related structures uh, 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 in the local government sphere. And then we have, we, are, we have also started to work on what we generally refer as local government transition framework, uh, bearing in mind that next year we are likely to have the local government elections. I think those are the few key issues that I thought I need to talk. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Thank you so much, DG. Uh, Honorable MEC Makamu. Thank you. Thank you. Chairperson, uh, and uh, thanks to yourselves for the opportunity and colleagues for having tried their level best to answer some of the questions. And thanks to the DG. I will talk a little bit about the TRUs vis a vis the sustainability as raised by Honorable Keza. That it is true that uh, since 1994, this government, which is in, of the day, has been eradicating shacks and building low-cost housing. And if observation could have been made that uh, since 1994, the type and the quality of houses that we were building has improved tremendously so. One of the things that you will be able to see is that what we are building as low-cost housing currently will be even roofed by heavy tiles as compared to what was built in 1994 as we took over the running of government. So I agree with him to say building of shacks will not necessarily be sustainable. But I think the context that I think I should make that everybody should be clear on the one in Talan was that it was a temporary structure where a project is under or is under to, to be commenced, where we are building a CRUs. 
in that particular area to accommodate people. And they were very specific, even when we allocated those four TTRUs to people who are 40 in number, that those are the people who have been assessed, who qualifies to be given uh, or to, uh, to qualify to be allocated uh, accommodation in terms of how human settlement runs. So it is not necessarily that this government is continuing. In fact, we were responding uh, with the challenges of COVID-19 to allow people uh, to do social distancing. And I should be able to indicate that between 2017 and 2020, because of the congestion in that uh, uh, place, we have lost four lives. Even if you could go and look at the people, how they are, you will have to choose the temporary measures and to wait until there's that particular time. So those structures are erected just for temporary measure. It's not sustainable. Like I said, I agree with what uh, Honorable Chesa said. It's for a temporary measure to resolve on that. The part that the DG dealt with, which talks about the negative publicity, which also Honorable Direko raised, it is a fact that we have accepted. And I think the DG has went very at length in terms of how we communicated with our public in terms of the a multi-million project launching by the Premier and all sorts of things. And I think he has gone uh, at length about that. And I will not want to continue to waste time because it is a fact that we are doing them as temporary structures. And uh, he also uh, explained how the issue of a caption of the front page of Soweto uh, said the Premier didn't know. And I think I will not want to talk to that, but the fact it's uh, as the MEC responsible for COCTA, I will not uh, have gone to an event with the Premier without having not briefed the Premier. That will not mean we are, and I think uh, it happened that way. Honorable Chesa spoke about water issues. He started with what, what 20 in Elias Simtualid, what 30 in Elias Simtualid, spoke about water in schools, spoke about water in Darlington. But I should be able to indicate that the area you refer to, if you want to club it under, it will call an Mutse area. One of the challenges we have in that particular area is a drought striking part of the country. Even when you drill boreholes, you, know, you necessarily not get Boreholes that will be able to yield water that will be able to be fit for consumption. And that's as a result, the Minister of Water and Sanitation was in that part of the uh, country talking about bringing a project that will be able to connect the people of Mutse with the water schemes which are there in order for us to do. But the fact remains that as a province where we could be able to drill and get water, we are trying to assist those communities. And we can only appreciate that having been it raised here, it's an indication that we should be able to continue to do. We have developed the three measures, the interim one where we are able to take trucks to give water. The medium term was to make sure that we connect people uh, with boreholes that are there, which are able to yield. And the long term is that we should be able to connect our communities with the water schemes that are there which the district is managing, which we are supporting in terms of them having those uh, other issues. There's been a question about the expenditure for the relief grant. And I see in my presentation, Chairperson, shows that we have spent the entire 14 million that we have received. What we raised as a challenge in the presentation was that we will liaise with the national disaster management center in order to account for that money. But the spending part of it, in terms of the conditions as set out by COCTA, uh, that of sanitation, that of uh, uh, PPEs and all those things, they are spending that uh, accordingly. But we will be able to deal with that part. Chairperson, you also raised an issue about spending of uh, which we are not necessarily doing well as a province that we presented here and showed that we are around 9%. Those are the MIG projects which have been reprioritized. 
and that we are able to be getting every necessary support. In my presentation chair, I indicated the area in water uh, in the Vembe, where in uh, submissions were to be made in order to approve their plans so that they can be able because some of them could not be approved because what they wanted to do and what was allocation of funds could not necessarily talk to each other. So I'm saying immediately after that, we will be able to make sure that our municipalities spend according to what has been uh, given in that regard. And I think we're working towards that. There was also a question you raised, Chair, which talks about, and I think the MEC of Health tried to answer as well. I think they are related to say, as Lipompo specifically member, to be precise, Musina, it's uh, bordering Zimbabwe. And as such, the management of the border will not necessarily, if it's not properly managed, uh, assist in spreading uh, the coronavirus. And I can say that uh, part of our pushback strategy as the provincial command council led by the premier, the entire exco at one point was at the border to be able to give support to the officials who are working there. And we should be able to report that we are continuing to work with the Department of Transport and Community Safety in the province to make sure that all the health protocols that needs to be uh, adhered to in the borders are followed and attended to. I think at one time we were at the media where the MEC for Health was forcing that people who were coming from Zimbabwe should be transported just from the border until at the time we're still at level four. That is an indication that we are taking the border very serious and we are working towards minimizing the spread through the border uh, as such. There is also a question which was asked about a road, R25, uh, which the question wanted to get to clarity in terms of where do we start as a province in terms of refurbishing, whether us and Pumalanga. And I think where I'm sitting, uh, I may not necessarily be in a position to talk to the specific places, but I think the MEC for Department of Road, uh, Public Works, Road and Infrastructure will be given this information as we are here to be able to handle it and be able to see where it is due to us to deal with it so that we can be able to fix it in terms of the observation of Honorable Chesa in terms uh, of dilapidated road. And I think we're taking that serious. We'll be able to attend to it. Uh, there was a last question which was raised uh, and the MEC squad tried uh, very much to talk to that maybe as a province who could be seen as the epicenter of corruption in terms of COVID-19 raised by Honorable Hussein. And I think we are taking that very light. MEC squad spoke about the SIU already taken on board. And the premier of the province in all our gatherings, every time we meet, he emphasized MEC. how we should be able MEC. to adhere to the a prescript in terms of procurement and taking care of the pass of government. And I think we are doing that. We are going to cooperate with any state entity that will be doing investigation like the MEC for uh, Treasury and the MEC for Health spoke about it. And all of us were committed to that part. And I think uh, the other issue I wanted to talk to, uh, the DG spoke about it in terms of our recovery plan and the support we should be giving municipalities. And I think he went to town about it because already uh, we have met with our municipalities to start to do. But also the National Department of Tourism was already starting to uh, be available to assist our municipalities uh, in order to attract so that the economic activities within their municipalities could start to thrive with the opening in terms of level two and all those things. So we are taking care of uh, assisting municipalities that will be able to revive their economy. So Chairperson, I, I may say that if some of the questions that could have been uh, raised, I might have missed them. Uh, maybe if we get the follow-ups, we will be able to deal with them. But as for now, I think we have tried as a team to respond to the questions from the honorable members. Thanks very much, Chairperson.
I think the last matter when I was interjecting, you wanted to say that you wanted to say that I did not say it. Okay, colleagues, I still think we need to take follow ups. Who wants to make follow ups? Peza. Who else? Hussein. Hussein. Who else? The two of you. Okay. Rosid Peza. Thank, th thank you very much, Chairperson. Uh, uh, none of my questions my were question. by the good doctor. Uh, in terms of health and in terms with regards to Philadelphia Hospital, uh, that caters for part of Elias Mutsualeti, part of Dr. J. Spunroka, and Tembisile Ani. I asked about the capacity issue. Uh, if they have a memorandum of understanding that they have between provinces, the province of Mbumalanga and the province of Limpopo. Uh, because that hospital currently, I went on to say that hospital currently is understaffed. And I then went on to ask if if there is indeed a memorandum of understanding, does it involve the vehicles that are moving, uh, transferring a, a, a patient from one province to the other? I, I didn't get an answer from that. Uh, secondly, Chair, I wanted to ask uh, if it's not a concerning issue uh, that 47 has tested positive. She said that um, it's three doctors who lost their lives. Uh, doesn't he see this as a serious setback uh, in terms of the department and in terms of uh, the province being a rural province? Uh, and how will it be able to attract more doctors uh, the, in, in that sense? Uh, the other one I wanted to follow up on, Chairperson, was the fact that uh, a, a, a social, department, social development was actually a, 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 a answering to us about the food distribution. Uh, you know, I wanted to ask about the involvement of other. He, she, 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 the MSC spoke about the the, the councillors having to to be part of of people and 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 them having to 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 be seen to be uh, participating in that manner. Uh, and in terms of those caters that are. Uh, uh, on the ground. Do those caters involve other uh, uh, councillors from opposition parties? And if not, uh, why not? Uh, uh, sorry about this. Just a moment, Chair. How, how that, that's have have a a, 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 a now a public awareness campaign uh, to 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 reduce the stigma the stigma stigmatization of the people that uh, have tested positively uh, for COVID nineteen and if that is so how much does this uh, cost the province. Uh, I think that uh, the, 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 that's that's uh, the, 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 there's a uh, two fifty million uh, spent in Mutse Park water supply project, which commenced in twenty eleven, chair. 
which was supposed to have been handed over or completed in August 2017, but till to date, the community does not see anything happening. Uh, while while pensioners continue to 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 push those uh, 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 wheelbarrows all the way to to the to the next river, I I just wanted to to ask uh, uh, how far is that project uh, in in Moze in, in and 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 what are the what are the real um, um, uh, issues pertaining to the 215 million that was spent since that time? I I, I raised the issue of, of those houses, Chair, merely because uh, I, I, I'm of the understanding that uh, even the RTP houses themselves, I do agree with the MC that uh, they, they are in a deplorable state. Uh, people are complaining about cracking uh, houses and so forth. I have not seen anything uh, uh, um, more than than what it is. It's an RTP and that's it. Uh, whether it restores dignity to people, uh, it's something that we'd have to discuss another day. But of course, we considering the fact that uh, uh, our people uh, live in those spaces uh, uh, where they they are confined, they are confined. They could kill each other easily. They could be easily neglected and so forth. And these questions that we are asking here are of our people. And in reality, uh, had, if there was everything that was done by the post 1994 government, I do not think that our people will be complaining. Uh, about such things. I mean, our people on the ground here even say that the four-room houses during uh, apartheid were, were actually as, are, are actually still intact even today. So uh, I, 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 I stay on the ground. I live with, with our people. These issues, uh, uh, they, they raise them uh, as they are pertaining to uh, the, 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 the the neglect that they've been encountered. Thank you, Chair. Oh, Honorable Kaiser, Honorable Hussein. Chair, I wanted to just um, um, recognize that um, the MEC for Health, in, in fairness to her, she's uh, I think she's responded, uh, in my view, I think adequately eventually to the questions that we put. And may I just say, Chairperson, that uh, uh, I think in fairness as well, uh, that when allegations appear in the public domain, we as a portfolio committee have every right to ask those questions. But at the same time, may I say that it should not in any way suggest that a person is guilty. And I want to put that on the record because um, as the as the investigation will continue, uh, it would be I think mostly unfair for any person, um, you know, for mud to stick against their their reputation when they themselves have not uh, been involved in any way whatsoever. So I I take on a word for it, and I appreciate the response and say thank you for that. On the same token, I'm sure that in the same way as how those allegations trouble us as a portfolio committee in the National Assembly. I'm sure it equally must be troubling her because it, it's attached to her as the political head. Um, and I'm sure that she wants to get to the bottom of it as well and separate herself uh, and her department and the good people who work in her department from the bad. So I, I, I hear and I um, recognize that uh, MEC Makamo has also indicated that the SIU is investigating. I just want to find out from the MEC of Health in that uh, is she going to ensure that the SIU investigates all of those uh, allegations around uh, the COVID-19 expenditure in her department? The bulk of that 600 odd million rand that has been spent has largely been spent uh, in the Department of Health. Um, and I think if she does that, uh, that will restore the confidence in her department in that you have a political head who's taking the bull by its horn, so to speak. And, and bringing in the SIU to investigate because these allegations are in the public domain. So that people will have a sense of comfort that you have a political leader there 
who is taking these things seriously and bringing in the SIU to investigate all of those COVID-19 expenditure. I was just not clear exactly what the SIU is investigating. They could very well be investigating one small portion of, uh, of some of the allegations. So if she can maybe just respond to that, whether she will ensure that the SIU investigates all of those contracts that have appeared in the public domain. Thank you, Chair. Honorable, um, thank you very much, Chairperson. I thought that I'm not going to speak, but I was listening to the conversation and the discussion of the portfolio committee. But when I listened to the MEC responding, I think it was from Honorable Kaiza asking about those um, um, uh, lower cost housing vis a vis checks that was dominating on the news. I was also puzzled by the response from the MEC, uh, boldly saying that those are temporal shelters that the department or the province is providing. And I think that uh, I saw in the presentation that each uh, house or temporal shelter cost 64,000. And it is with that reason that also uh, was viral to the uh, uh, to, 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 to the public because the cost is very high. And when the MEC comes here and say that those are the temporal structures, without further convincing, convincing the committee, it's very disturbing. I didn't. I don't know if I heard him correctly to say that that you go and erect a temporal shelter of sixty four thousand which we know very well, we are activists as well, you know very well that it can't even cost more than 15,000. So to come here and say the province partly is it's spending 64,000 with that thing, which does not even convening, convincing, is a disturbance. Chair, I don't know if I heard him very correctly. So I would like to get more response from the, the MEC about those temporal shelters that call that is a cause for concern also in the public taking into consideration that limpopo is one of the provinces that is swimming into poverty and to come and play with words to come and play with taxpayers money is not going to occur well with this committee and we must get satisfactory in order to go and explain to our people in the province the second issue chair I think uh, Honorable Hussein tried to, to raise it uh, in terms of the 185 million contract that uh, was reported on the Sunday Independent newspaper that the Provincial Health Department awarded a KwaZulu Natal company. And I read this story as well. And uh, if the MEC of Health can also come clean and explain to the committee here, if is it true what was reported on the Sunday Independent newspaper to say that uh, company it was not even on the database of the province and uh, maybe she can share some light if it's true or if it's not true because if it's true it means that um there's a lot of things that is going on in the department but i also want to say that i was watching when she she, she responded to, to honorable hussein and then honorable hussein come back so i just want to say to the mc at least um she came back and explained herself to say she's not rude and she is not even intended to be rude because I was also puzzled by, by her response. But let us uh, also acknowledge that she said no. Maybe it's just because she has a strong voice. Uh, that's why she responded the way she responded because I was also dis I was also disturbed. But I told myself that no, now I'm not going to talk. But uh, she came back and said no, it's because she has a strong voice. Uh, when we raise things here, we are not personal, but as a portfolio committee, we want to get more clarity on behalf of the people. And secondly, we are doing the oversight. So it's our duty to, to ask difficult questions. And it's not because we want to be difficult to colleagues, but we want to make sure that the, the money that must be used is used correctly. And the, we are the voiceless of the people on the ground as a portfolio committee. So thank you very much, Chair. I think the two MECs will clarify me on those two aspects. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Honorable Mpumza. Thank you, Chair. 
Am I on table chat? Let's go a bit up or back. We only sing it. Oh. Yes. Yes. Uh, hey, I hey, might hey, your eyes as well. My eyes. <laughs> your eyes. Right. No, I'm very tall, Chair. Don't know what I'm very tall. Thank you, Chair. Uh, 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 Chairperson, uh, the, the, the presentation uh, reflects that uh, the, the province has apparently opted for the borehole technology <laughs> in uh, providing access access to water and sanitation. And uh, <clears throat> here it reflects that uh, you, you, they have already energized around about uh, 80 poles, while they are busy now energizing 74. And the 407, the MEC indicated that they are in different stages of implementation. Now that uh, they have chosen uh, the borehole technology as the only means of uh, providing uh, access to water and sanitation services, is the groundwater protocol having the sufficient yield over adequate timelines going into the future? And from a planning perspective, linking this to our vision of a capable developmental state that would intervene aggressively in the provision of services and in the building the economy of the province. Is this a borehole choice? really sustainably able to weather the storms of uh, drought that uh, in the event of a drought storm, it would be weathered by this pool. There would be no event when these pools might dry up and the depths might actually provide water, or uh, wind instead of water and then the communities might run out of water. What is the alternative backup to this uh, borehole approach? Um, out of the RP, is it not possible that the province might be, the RP being the funding window for uh, regional bulk water schemes? Is the province also not thinking towards that direction so that you have uh, a sustainable a water provision and a water resource. The last short of my question, Chair, again, the, the COVID response plan is presented. I, I don't know, Chair, guided by you. I might have missed that. I have not uh, seen a clear fiscal and economic outlook plan going forward that is related to the post-COVID-19 economic recovery plan. That would, in the end, absorb the 200,000 age 2024 youth that are in the SRD grant. Well, what is the post-COVID aggressive economic plan that would reflect that the province is indeed a developmental state uh, that is intervening aggressively in the economy to ensure that the post-COVID plan would indeed salvage the province from the economic contraction provided by COVID. Thanks, Chair. Honorable Mpumza, MEC for Health, you go to slide uh, 17 of the presentation with regard to the recruitment for COVID-19 research. 
Yes, I heard you saying that you are fine with the stuff that you are having. But then, if you are to look on the medical uh, officers, you're saying you are fine with the stuff of the, that you're having, but on the update, you're still telling us around one interview is done. So the same thing with professional nurses. Out of the 362 ones required, only appointed 43. Then it's still round one interview then. With regard to the enrolled nurses, uh, you need 167. You said first shoot listing is done, appointments in progress, but you say you are still fine. Can you uh, talk to this slide on slide 17? Because on the others with regard to professional nurses, you say 838, first you're closing down, so you don't even uh, tell us what's the status. On the ENs and PHC, there's no figure there, but you're saying first you're closing down. So I'm raising it in terms of the accuracy of information that is provided to us to enable us to do oversight. So that's the area that one was raising because then under the circumstances, this gives us a cause of concern as a committee. Maybe you can clarify this slide better than you do. You can do. Then the other issue that one wanted to raise is back to the MEC for education with regard to the issue of the water provision in slide 66. Yes, MEC, we should have heard what you said, but then you raised this an issue there of the financial implications. I thought you're going to say that now that that agreement has come to an end, this is what we must do. And this is how we've planned to address this expenditure than to only say there's financial uh, implications and then you don't tell us what you're going to do. Because where we are seated, our biggest worry here is that post COVID-19, the ideal situation is that these schools mustn't revert back where you find that there's no water. So the department then must continue to, to budget so that uh, kids at schools and teachers are able to have water. The other thing that I don't see in your report on education is the number of infections since the schools have reopened. Yes, I've seen something where you're talking about the comorbidities of people who have asked to be recused and the rest, but the reality is that there's been some infections in the schools. And then that report is not shared with us. Maybe you can talk to it. I've missed it on the slide, but I couldn't locate it within uh, the slides. The other issue, MEC, I raised the issue of Mbola Trust in slide 69. And then I wanted the details in terms of the place, quantity, and price. And also the feedback as to who was responsible for the provisioning costs. That, 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 that matter to me remain unanswered. I didn't hear the, the response coming from you, MEC for Education. Maybe if you can then assist us to respond to that, that will also do. The other issue was about the disaster plans. Uh, for both, I expected when the MEC of Health didn't do that, uh, didn't respond to that, I should have expected, I thought maybe the, the MEC for Cockstar will respond to that. Uh, it seems as if this matter is not maybe appealing unless I'm told otherwise. Because the question was that in terms of the Section 38 of the Disaster Management Act, uh, each department, in this one in particular, asked the Department of Health to say, are you considering as the Department of Health developing a disaster management plan in line with Section 38 of the Act? Secondly, also now, uh, we know in terms of legislation, Coxta, the question to you was in relation to say, as Coxta, are you also prepared to prepare a robust provincial multi-hazard disaster management plan of the entire province to deal proactively with fisher disasters like this one. And then I further ask, what are the arrangements in that regard? And then also because each and every department, which other departments within the province have you identified 
to start developing plans and building disaster management capacity and the time frames for that. And then the following up with regard to that also, this must go down to municipalities. Then I even asked, when you meet as the provincial command councillors, so council, which municipalities then included the COVID-19 resilience building in the IDPs? Because this is happening during the tenure when the IDPs were being uh, uh, reviewed. So are you able to proudly tell us that in the province, this is the number of municipalities that have then included COVID-19 resilience, resilience building in their ITPs, and they've provided a, a budget for this amount. Those are the things that I couldn't hear coming clearly. Then the other issue was around the 149,000 MEC. You are saying the money is spent with regard to the money that was allocated in May by COCTA. But the report that we got, as the department was uh, reporting to us, it was only 149,000. So then if you are saying then the, amount, the, the money is spent and in line with the stringent requirements as uh, the National Disaster Management uh, Center, Cocktail National has prescribed. So can you then maybe give us that report? Can give you up to Tuesday next week to get that report because when you check with Kakta, that report from your municipalities in the province is not uh, coming. So we wish we can commit to submit this within uh, by Tuesday next week. Then at least we'll be okay and cover to say indeed this is what is happening. So basically on my side, those are the issues that I had concern on. Over to you, MEC and Tim, MEC Makam. Thanks. I would allow MEC Ramatupa to start. MEC uh, Education to follow, and then I will come. I think it's the only, the three of us who should uh, take the follow ups. Can you start? Yes. No, thank, thanks, uh, Chair. Let me once more appreciate uh, this opportunity and, and apologize for the questions that were raised regarding Philadelphia. I think I, I missed them uh, to respond to them. Uh, it was just an omission. Honorable Chair, we have not uh, completed the process towards the signing of the memorandum of understanding. I think we were disturbed mainly by the level five lockdown uh, because we were at a, a stage where in, we've already established different branches because uh, we, we wanted to do things uh, differently so that we look at our PHC, how can we collaborate uh, as two provinces that are sharing uh, this particular uh, uh, institution? And we're also looking at uh, the area of, because there are clinics that are within uh, Limpopo province and the residents of Pumalanga would be closer to, because in terms of, of you know, the health, uh, we are saying your nearest facility uh, becomes uh, your your first uh, point of entry as you access healthcare. So so we want to look at this particular stream that will be able to then say if I'm sick in Limpopo, but my nearest clinic in Limpopo is 10 kilometers, which is not within the norm. But the nearest clinic in Pumalanga, it's within the five kilometer. A radius, which is what is within the norm. So we want uh, that particular uh, stri uh, the stream to look into that. There is also another stream of EMS, which will address uh, what uh, honorable members are asking, uh, that will be able to deal with the uh, uh, transportation of a patient, especially looking at our emergency uh, uh, cases uh, that we pick up to say, if I get an accident, a two kilometer from the border, 
and the EMS station that is closer to my border should be this because uh, you would understand that this will not necessarily uh, affect the Elias Mutualady or Philadelphia Hospital. It will then also assist us in addressing even other areas like around a Villa Villa. We are also, there is a stream that is working on pharmacy, the one that works on tertiary uh, institutions. If you look at uh, the referral, because you, you let's say you've got an accident uh, from the Mpumalanga side, you then are taken to Philadelphia because it's close to you. Then you need uh, probably orthopedic surgeon uh, who currently is not there in Philadelphia, who must transfer you to Mount Wayne. So such a tertiary uh, a agreement should be done and also the regional stream uh, should have been. So all these um, uh, are looking into that and they will finalize them. Yes, indeed, honorable members, uh, there is a serious challenge when it comes to uh, the staff uh, shortage in Philadelphia. One of the issues, uh, you'll remember that uh, towards the end of uh, last year and the beginning, Philadelphia has been on, on media for all the wrong reasons. And you might have noticed that after we made some intervention, it has not been, uh, you have not even had uh, the community around Mose going uh, and continuously uh, complaining. It's because, of course, we made intervention and get uh, uh, the, the CEO. Uh, and now he has been within uh, his 100 days recruited for, for medical specialists because Philadelphia is a regional hospital. Uh, the one, the surgeon and the pediatricians, two of them are physicians. Uh, uh, the end, beginning of this month, they will be joined by anesthesia, uh, uh, anesthesi uh, somewhat who is specializing in anesthesia and also somebody who is specializing in ops and kind. So we we are gradually trying to fill in uh, those, especially the critical uh, posts uh, that have been vacant and which is also perpetuated by the fact that uh, they are dealing with uh, the patients that are not necessarily within uh, their their vicinity, but we we are working on that. And uh, let me reassure honourable members that uh, very soon, with the current uh, leadership in that hospital, working with the district and the uh, provincial office, the memorandum will be signed very soon. There is a, 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 a cooperation between the provinces because we both appreciate and understand that. It's all about our own uh, poor people who cannot uh, afford the, 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 the private health care. Now, honorable members, on the issues of stigmatization, we must indicate that as a province, as early as the 2nd of June, uh, we picked up already that there has been even a worse stigmatization amongst even the healthcare uh, professionals uh, themselves or healthcare workers. That's why we launch our campaign on stigmatization, not only focusing on healthcare workers, but at the community at large. We have not spent, a, I would not say, a, like, I, I can't quantify what we spend because what we do in our health promotion campaigns, mostly we develop our own material in-house. For instance, in this particular campaign, we, we went on, if you, if you go to our social a, a media, our Facebook page, you will find all the posters in all the languages that are spoken in Limpop, where you'll find uh, all those uh, trying to talk and appeal to the communities about a, a stigmatization to show the danger of it, that it will then make people not to come out, out when they test positive, and that results in people spreading the infections because they are afraid to talk, because they are afraid to be to be stigmatized. So, and we also adopted a, a position that everyone it's it's COVID positive, irrespective of who you are. So, if we do that, then it means we will all of us wear masks because we are all positive. We will all practice social distance because we are all positive. We will sanitize and, and hand, uh, do hand washing or do hand washing with water and soap because we are all positive we don't want to infect each other so and then when all of us are positive then you would not see uh, the stigmatization and also we we as a department of health we discourage the issue of because i've seen that some media houses when someone who is known test positive 
they would want to put pressure on us to, to pronounce, which ethically is not correct. As a, as a department, we, we always advise to say, let it be the person themselves. And we always encourage individuals, especially those who are known to say, once you inform your family and your next of kin, you can now on your own go out and tell the public that you are positive. That will assist in, in fighting a, a, the stigmatization and also reduce the perpetuation of, of the stigma a, and stigmatization of those who are a positive. So we, we want to appreciate uh, most of the media houses because when we launched this particular campaign, they came on board and they gave us lots to be able to, to, to spread the message uh, uh, to, the, to the community. And we think when we look back, we have realized that uh, the issue of stigmatization, it's no longer before when if somebody tests positive in the, the year, someone in the mall tested positive, they will be calling and uh, for the shutting down of the mall and whatever. Because we are treating each other, all of us as positive, Meaning, even if I was in the mall with someone who's positive, because I'm in my full PPE and practicing social distance, there's no need for me to be panicking that I might have been infected. Even if you are in the office, that's why, as a as a department, we discourage the fact that when an employee tests positive, they must be shutting down of office. But that is also perpetuating the stigma to say, "Oh, somebody tests positive, close the building, let's fumigate, let's do that." We, we discourage that because we are saying, let's behave as if all of us who are coming to work are positive. Then we will be protecting each other against each other. So even if they hear that I have tested positive, it will not be a problem. So that work has been done. And we have we've also been using our uh, systems that we had of Cheka in Pilo. You, you know, as launched by Sanak, as we were dealing with the HIV and AIDS pandemic. So those, those systems, because they are still there, we have incorporated the issue of fighting COVID because the very system that we use of fighting the stigmatization of HIV and AIDS, we are now using it uh, to fight the, the stigmatization of COVID-19. Uh, honorable members, the loss of, uh, I said there's a third doctor now, uh, it's a real a, a blow for the, for the province uh, that have indicated to say even if these three doctors were not under the employment of the department of health but at the end of the day these are the three independent practitioners who were uh, practicing in the rural areas that is why it becomes a a, a real blow because to attract a, a gp to go and work and open a practice in a village or in a rural area, it's not easy. All, or most of our healthcare professionals would want to see themselves uh, running their own practices in the city. So the loss of these three doctors, it's a blow. And I said, when, when you look at the infection rate of our healthcare workers, it, it's increasing and it's a worrying factor. What comfort us is to say, when you look at the public service a, a, a part, we have done well in terms of the recovery rate because we have not lost if, even a single doctor or nurse or a cleaner. Despite that, the numbers are very high and the, 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 the staff working in the public sector, uh, the numbers are very high compared to the private sector. I then further on said, uh, honorable members, what we, we are currently doing is to say lessons learned from the public sector, which has assisted us not to record a single death, must be implemented in the private sector to say, how do we help the GP for them to be able to put on the full PPE and also for them to treat every single patient as if they are positive? How do we then assist a GP with comorbidity? How do we do that so that it's not, we should not focus on one sector. For us, it's, it's a department of health. For us, it's the healthcare workers. They are the same. They might not be on our payroll, but these are a uh, healthcare workers, frontliners, last line of defense, who are rendering services to the people of Limpopo. So, so for us, we have said, we are now going to be assisting them, even monitoring the manner in which 
we monitor our public hospitals that the CEO has ordered the PEPEs. And when, when we do rounds in our hospitals, we go and check if a doctor is wearing the PPE or a nurse. If you are not, we even go to an ex extent of charging you to say we are charging you with the offense of threatening your life, the life of your family, and also the life of your colleagues and of your patients. So that's what we say you must uh, take responsibility of wearing your PPE. And if the CEO has not done their part uh, of order, ordering the PPE, we, we, we will uh, uh, have to, 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 to take action. Then the other area uh, that we are looking at, uh, it, it, it's uh, of course uh, doing inspection in their practices so that we can support them and work together as a collective. Uh, then there, is, there are questions of uh, recruitment of staff. We are saying uh, Honourable members, uh, uh, Chairperson, uh, uh, maybe here it's, it's the language uh, that probably we will have used, uh, which uh, sounded to be confusing. We are saying the Department of Health has been having a shortage of staff even prior COVID. We have been working under difficult situation when you look at our cleaners, our nurses, and our medical specialists. And, and when COVID came, it find us with all those challenges. But then we did, we, we, when COVID, COVID comes, we had to look for other staff to assist us. We have not done well on that part because mainly these people are scarce. They are not there in the market, especially our specialty nurses and the uh, uh, specialty doctors and also the medical officers. When we said, we should not have used the word that we are fine. We should have said to say, when you look at COVID vis-a-vis -vis the staff, the, the current uh, uh, as, uh, uh, challenges uh, that we are having because of our pushback strategy, which we fought towards a reduction of new infections, we are then uh, able to cope. That's all we should say to say, for now, we are coping. But we can't say the same. That's hence we're saying we are struggling. We want to recruit them. We want to have them so that if tomorrow we are going to find ourselves having a thousand infections and 500 people warranting a admission, we should be ready to deal with that. So we are not fine with the staff now. We are just coping in the difficulty that we have. And 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 lastly, on what a uh, a uh, 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 the 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 Honorable Hussein has indicated. Honorable Hussein, I, I need to reassure you that I came to a department that was bleeding financially with accruals of more than 1.4 billion. We had tried very hard and worked very hard to make sure we, we, we look after every single cent in the department. And towards the end of this financial year, we were at a budget, a, a, we were at accruals of 500 million which is still unacceptable. Of course, COVID might have made a setback, but we, we, we are saying this because we are equally worried that there is no single cent that is allocated towards fighting COVID that must find itself in the wrong place. And that I can reassure you that if uh, any, 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 evidence that is brought or any allegations, we will never ignore it. You have had the MEC for education for, for Treasury and, and the MEC Makamu that we will never take any allegation of a, a corruption a very light. It has to be investigated. And the best people to investigate it those that are not within a, our system. And hence we are saying we are cooperating with SIU for anything that they want in our department. And let me also say, it is for my own interest, having worked very hard for my integrity to be where it is today, for me to 
read all these things, it's not like I would sleep peacefully. Because when you know that you have not done anything wrong, but no amount of moving from one radio station to another or from one newspaper to another trying to, to explain yourself will make the public out there to believe that you are innocent. But there are credible bodies. For instance, your auditor general, as they are busy auditing, they must be able to come out and say, the Department of Health in Lipopo, you have done wrong one, two, three, four. Then, they, 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 then we must act on that. Or they must say, Limpopo, you have done well. Then we know our uh, co we will be cleared. Those are the bodies, you know, the SIU, those are the institutions that can be able to assist us. Hence, you hear me talking with confidence that there is in no way we can deny them to do, especially that even the president has made that proclamation. So none of us have even have a right to can refuse a, a SIU to enter our books and look into every single cent that is supposed towards saving lives of our people. Some of us as have been working in this sector our entire life, and ours has been a role of saving lives and preserving lives. And we know when you, you are stealing from that particular purse of the public, you are then denying people access to health. You are making sure that a person who could have been saved in an ICU because there's no IC ventilator which was bought, because the money did not go to buy the ventilator, the person will die and life comes first. Once you die, you can't reverse uh, that. So that goes to the last one, which says uh, MEC, the allegation of saying was th were their companies on the database. We had a meeting with Treasury this, mo this morning when they had re re uh, given us a reassurance that all the companies that were appointed are in the CSD. But, uh, but I'm saying that will not be enough until you get your AG, which is an external body, uh, that will be, you can think that maybe MEC Squat is my colleague, uh, then we will be covering each other. Hence, I'm saying we need those bodies to come in and clear our names. Thank you very much. You see, you have not yet responded to the issue of the plans, the health plans, MEC. You have not yet done that. Honorable Chair, which which I'm trying to look at the questions. I might have missed that question. The issue of the health plan in terms of the Disaster Management Act. Oh, what, what I can reassure you is that we, we do have a health plan. We do it in terms of our disaster management, which is uh, our disaster management uh, uh, in, the pro in the department, which also, remember the provincial di uh, disaster uh, uh, plan uh, uh, management, it's, it's, it's led by a uh, Cogster. So our, pro our department as a health has been having its own because we've been dealing with disaster, if you'll remember, Chair, a disaster like cholera, when they were there, we always activate. A disaster like the time when we had serious challenges of malaria, we activate. Sometimes we'll have disasters like typhoid. Uh, there was the time when we had listerosis. Uh, we do have the, the, the plan that is there and the, the, the committee that is chaired by Mr. Philip Kruger. So it is there uh, and, and it, it gets activated every time. And within the, 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 the plan that looks into that, we, we would have a response team that will therefore looking at that particular disaster at that time. But the overall, it's, it's, it's there. Can you say and we are always guided by Coxter. Can you share with the specific Department of Health Plan, as you are saying it's available, it can be shared by, by we will. people and business a day after tomorrow. It's there. Just share it with us. We want I'm to sure see the content. The content of it then you can do that. It's something within your well, definitely. Can we also, can we also agree in terms of the slide I've referred you to that you, you must revise it so that it talks to the specific 
because the way it is is okay. like everything is very problematic. The way it is, you will agree with me. I've referred to you how these other matters have been presented there. Some some weight figures that get hanging somewhere. You've seen that slide 17. As it is, there's no confusion on our part. That's why we said we are concerned in terms of this to say, you said you need these numbers, then you're not hired. But when you look at the slide itself, some figures are even missing. And the comments to that effect, uh, you, you, look, you, you look on the issue of professional nurses, PHC and community, including NS and PHC. You're saying you have shortlisted out of our, how many numbers and the comment on the other side, on the others. So if you can make sure that that slide gets uh, revised. Over to you, OMC Bushir. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson, and good evening uh, again to committee members, my colleagues, and our staff. Uh, let me start with the number of cases. Please, we are hearing all your conversation with the person at the background. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chairperson. Let me start with the question you asked about the COVID-19 cases. Uh, in terms of Lepopo up to today, number of teachers infected is 183, numbers of learners infected is 97, number of non-teaching staff is 12. But also let me give you information in terms of learner exemptions and comorbidities. 299 learners have been granted to learn from home because of comorbidities. 166 learners have applied for homeschooling and that has been approved. 796 are kept at home by their parents because of uncertainty and anxiety. And the department is collecting all the information of the grade 12 and seven learners that came back and then we can be able to get uh, other information also as the other grades are coming on the 24th and the last one on the 31st. Uh, in terms of addressing the expenditure of water, yes, uh, Honorable Chairperson, I agree with you. The main aim is not to go back to where schools did not have water. That is why our PCC, Provincial Command Council, have taken a decision that uh, from now onwards, the issue of water and sanitation is going to be driven by MEC Makamu Kokta together with water service authorities. Uh, last week they met, uh, they there is a service level agreement that they have done. What they are waiting for is to de the de determination of the rate in terms of how much are, are we supposed to pay uh, for the water. So after that, we'll be able to do that. And I must also say, uh, Cocta is also assisting us and the water service authorities are assisting us in this regard. In terms of the budget, uh, the budget committee and EXCO, uh, and we even presented the adjustment budget uh, of Limpopo in terms of COVID-19, and we have been allocated funds to deal with, with COVID-19, because as you know, we didn't have any funds to deal with COVID-19. That's why we're using what we have and also using the norms and standards at our school. So I agree with you, we will never agree to go back. In terms of uh, provision of water, Chairperson, uh, in Limpopo, uh, we are providing for the 250, and our cost is 1.4 million. The other one of um, Vula is the agreement between Vula and the uh, National Department of Basic Education. And I don't have the figures with me. I will ask the minister and forward them uh, to you, Chairperson. And I think I've answered all the questions, uh, Chairperson. Thank you very much. Okay. MEC Makamu, before MEC Makamu, MEC, before you MEC Makamu, think there was a question that was referred to MEC Squatty by Honorable Mkalip. 
Yes. Emis is what? Emis is what is still with us? Yes, he's still with uh, yeah, the meeting. The issue of I'm the playing, I can't call the. Let me remind you what is it. Let me remind you what is it. Yes. I was writing it down. There was the issue of a contractor from KwaZulu Natala of a company that got 185 million contract without being on the official database of suppliers. And what Honorable Mkalipu was raising, what is your response and take to this allegation? Mindful of the fact that uh, the SIU is going to deal with that, but this is a straightforward matter that Honorable Mkalipu needed your response to. Uh, Chair, I thought that already made uh, a remark that uh, we will. Uh, leave no stone unturned if there's any wrongdoing in terms of uh, anybody that uh, might have uh, um, done anything that uh, is not justifiable we will have to make sure that everybody accounts hence i did not want us to really uh, start saying this is what we are going to do to this uh, uh, company a or b Rather, leave it to those uh, who are investigating, who will then be able to give us a report that this, this is the outcome and this is what we think uh, should actually happen. Okay. Thanks. No. Okay. You are saying no, ne? yes. What yeah, is no. But what is the use of the MEC coming to the portfolio committee here if you are going to raise questions that is not going to be answered? We are not asking you about investigation, but we want you as the MEC to confirm if that company that was on the newspaper, if it is true that is not part of the database, yes or no? no, no. And then the other matter no. is Okay. Now I, I hear what you are saying, Reverend Kalipe, but in terms of the information that we have, all the companies are actually on the database. Okay. If that uh, satisfies, yes. Hence, I'm saying, because in terms of administrative uh, processes, that's what we have been looking at as a provincial treasury to make sure that everyone who has actually supplied uh, goods and services is actually on the database. That is the process that we have undertaken ourselves as provincial treasury, and the rest will then be uh, looked at uh, by this uh, other law enforcement agencies. Yes. But then, in in essence, uh, Ms. Squatty, the essence of this question would say, you must never outsource your accounting responsibility and oversight responsibility to law enforcement agencies. There are these things, even if the law enforcement agencies are still going to come but you will have information at your disposal. That was the rationale with regard to the question. But like you have indicated, the response is that that company is in the database. Let's move to MEC. Mm. MEC, madam. Th thanks, Chairperson. Uh, but also there is one question which was asked by Honorable Chesa about councillors uh, involved in the food parcel distribution. Uh, after I spoke, I think uh, through your indulgence, you may allow MEC Rahwale to deal with that question uh, after I have dealt with my questions. I'm requesting that. The first question about the 250 million of projects which started in 2011 at the uh, Skukune district. I think the I have made been I've been made aware about that project which is not complete. That's why now when the minister was around to want to resolve the challenges of water in the Skukune district, Mutse area, uh, implementing agent in the water board, Lipele Northern Water, will be responsible to deal because part of what has happened 
was that the municipality appointed people without capacity to resolve the challenges of water, maybe due to capacity in the municipality. So we are not going to repeat that challenge and uh, allow the water service authority in that space. So it's a matter that I am aware of that about three contractors were appointed and could not, but also the investigation is dealing with that part. So it's a matter that is receiving attention from the National Water and Sanitation. The other uh, question was about the 64,000, the MEC becoming bold to talk about it. Of course, if I have been also been using a strong word that I'm bold, uh, my apologies. But what I was saying in terms of the uh, temporary residential units is that there were specifications which were compiled to construct that uh, temporary residential unit. And I will not call it any other uh, thing other than the TRUs as they are called. And the uh, other Mkalipi, of course, compared to it to say, I may construct a check to equal to that at around 15,000 rand. And I'm saying, in this uh, case, uh, when you build in the human settlement, whether it's a low cost housing or that temporary structure, the amount of money is fixed. That's why we have commissioned together with the national department to do investigation if whether the 64,000 that we talk about, which is intended to do a temporary residential unit, it's worth doing that. And we are not, we are great even at the beginning to say the negative publicity that we received, uh, we are worried about as a province. But also I should indicate a chairperson of the portfolio that Lipompo being a poor province, if you look at the statistics South Africa and show in terms of the informal settlement, we are one of the provinces that has got the least informal settlement. So our people may not necessarily be used to such structures in the province because we are doing it for the first time where you go and erect temporary structures in the number 40 or 100 like it is. You will have a temporary structure in a case where somebody has... Uh, lost their house through fire or some other things. And people will appreciate that. And uh, we should not necessarily underestimate that. And we say people in the province and the people in the country, they know the province to be uh, building low cost housing. And they think we have lowered the bar and we are taking that responsibility. That's why the DG and myself spoke about how we communicated in that regard. It was not to talk about being bold on that. Hence, there is a process to want to verify what is it that has been delivered. But also, uh, uh, Chairperson, Honorable Chesa spoke about, since 1994, the uh, issue of the houses that are cracking and what, and he compared it with the four-roomed house which were built uh, during the apartheid times. And he said something which I think we have shared the common, that is on the ground. I'm also staying in a village, even myself as I speak, as an MEC here in the village called Dunkur. I'm also on the ground. When people are receiving the current RDP houses that we are building, some even cry tears to appreciate when we are giving them these houses because they bring dignity. It's a fact that you can't compare them with the four-room houses. Where I come from, there are almost 91 villages in Guyane where in the apartheid government, it was only in the township where they will build not more than 300 houses as the four-roomed house at the time. Currently, each and every year as a province, we don't build not less than 3,000 houses that we give to people wherever they stay, not necessarily people in the township. So I'm saying to compare the uh, apartheid four-roomed house and what we are giving today, I don't think it, you are comparing the same uh, uh, comparables. Uh, it could be an apple and orange. It could not be uh, because those ones were done just specifically in a particular area, few of them. But look at the number of houses that we have delivered since 1994 until to date. No other government has done that. And I'm saying in terms of the quality that we are giving, currently, wherever we do a slab, there is a 
quality assurance by the National Home Builders uh, Association to come and look at what is it that quality we are doing. When we finish the world plate, they do assessment. So quality is being emphasized as we do compared to what we started in 1994. So comparing the two, I don't necessarily agree that they are the same. The next question by Honorable Pumza, it was about the issue of sustainability of the bowls that we spoke about. And in my presentation, and when I was trying to respond to the answers, I showed that we have got three measures that we are also providing water tankers in an area where we don't necessarily have water at all. And I said that boreholes is not our ultimate or the only solution. It's a medium term measure that we do. When I spoke, I even showed how difficult it is for us around the Mutze area in terms of drought, which Honorable Pumza raised as well. So the issue is not, it's an interim measure which is a medium term in terms of our plan. We are using the RBIG that Honorable Pumza spoke about to ensure that we connect to our bad system. It's only we can be able to talk about in Skukune, the Flag Bichelo project that we are trying to want to implement and connect people. That is the ultimate uh, plan of government in terms of a water uh, service uh, uh, plan. So it is not necessary that we see boreholes as the ultimate solution to the challenges of water in the province. But a province like us, where we require water sources from different areas, we, we sometimes uh, have a challenge of rains. So you should be able to do that. So groundwater to us is not an ultimate solution. We also have the other issues. The issue of the post-COVID recovery plan that Honorable Pumza raised, I think the DG of the province spoke about that part. And we do have, and I think, uh, Honorable Chair, in terms of the guidance on how we uh, prepared our presentation, we have a solid economic recovery plan of the province post the COVID, uh, which has gone through clusters and all other things, which we should be able to. What we said here is that we are going to take it lower to our local municipalities and district to make sure that they also do what provincial government has done in order to cover even what he has mentioned about the age cohort, which I spoke in the presentation to say almost people between the age of 2024, 20, there are almost more than 200 of them who are in the SRD. So we have the plan to be able to look at the uh, how do we resuscitate economy after the COVID. So uh, that part has been mentioned. I think there is other question Chairperson, you raised uh, earlier, which was not responded to, about whether uh, the multi-hazard plans for the provincial government is there or not. And I heard the MEC for Health trying to talk to specific, uh, say, malaria in a particular area, all those things. But as the province, because we don't have the comprehensive that, but the Department of Agriculture, you will know, sometimes will have foot and mouth disease, which will be a disaster in the particular area, specifically the area of Mbembe Mopan. But we are going to look at the areas with the lessons we have learned after the COVID to consider the Department of Health, the Department of Road and Public Works, because once rains comes, they will uh, destroy, destroy roads and also in agriculture, whether it's fire or whatever. With the lessons learned out of this, uh, current uh, pandemic, I think as a province will be able to go that, consolidate with what the MEC for Health said uh, uh, she has. But I think we may want not necessarily just for a specific department health as such. Leading by us as the custody of disaster management, we should compile a comprehensive that will be able to deal with disaster from whichever angle, not only from health perspective. The last issue you asked, it's whether our municipalities have considered during their IDPs to include a specific disasters that would be because it happened during when they had the disaster. Of course, on a general uh, perspective, they have included how they will deal with disasters. But I think the assessment 
uh, that should be done to see the credibility of our IDPs as we uh, deal with it, should be able to point us to us that we should be able to look at specific uh, response that our IDPs should be able to cater that. And through the guidance from this portfolio, I think we're going to consider taking that. Uh, and when we do assessment, look at that a chapter that will deal with disaster to be more specific and more response on the challenges that we may end. So maybe like I requested, MEC uh, Rahwale might want to respond through you, Chair, on the issue of the involvement of councillors in the food distribution or food parcel distribution. Thanks. Yes, MEC Rahwale. Thank you, Chairperson, once more. Uh, let him indicate that, that there was a, a question from Honorable uh, I hope uh, my apologies if I'm not yeah. pronouncing it well. I bet I, as well, and he must understand we all come from Limpop. He understands mm. things. Uh, Thank you so much, uh, Chairperson. But I think this is the MS is trying, unlike you, Chair, the MS is trying to say, eh, when I always say, eh. <laughs> Yeah, I'll teach her. Uh, uh, don't worry about that. I think let me indicate that, Chairperson, uh, if if there was a time when we, we have witnessed uh, unity in action is when we're dealing with or responding to COVID-19, especially when it comes to issues of uh, food distribution. I must indicate, Chairperson, that uh, there was also a session where Premier called all political organizations that are represented in our provincial legislature to take them through from ourselves as social development, we're taking them through the plan that we have and the distribution plan and the identification plan. And all of them were happy. And I'm sure uh, Honorable will agree with me that there have not been some cases in Mpopo where we, 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 we had people fighting over food or all those kind of things because of the kind of uh, uh, the system that we're using, which was also bought in by all the political organizations that we met with the premier. So I think uh, there were no issues and uh, it, it's good that you asked, but I want to indicate that also the advice they gave on that day was that try to take politi pol political uh, involvement or the involvement of politics in the whole process so that we are not going to experience challenges. And since then, indeed, as in when there were issues, they'll call us direct because you know most of them are also uh, participating in the portfolio committee, they will call from a portfolio committee point of view to say, we hear this kind of a thing, a uh, 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 MEC can investigate and quickly tell us what is happening. And we're able to do that. And that is why we did not have a number of issues. So I think that that's what transpired in Limpo for Chairperson. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, I still think we must come towards the end of our meeting. And I know there are colleagues who, who are trying to indicate in the group here that they are not happy, but we can check also on the time. But then uh, the other issue, MEC Makam, is the leader of uh, uh, this delegation. Last two weeks ago, last week, two weeks, yes, we had how thing with it was similar allegations of this nature when it comes to issue of PDP. But we'll see, we should have learned from how thing. They have been decisive, unlike folding their arms to await the law enforcement agencies to do their work. The thing that we are not hearing from you here. And then the issue of the committee's concern, speaking on of the behalf, is the appetite to address these meetings as they are in the public space. So I think mm -hmm. uh, moving forward, we will have to, to engage with you so that you, you then address us on this matter. because. You see, not everything, as you, you remember, as I was talking to, to, to Honorable Sipat, you have got a responsibility as the provincial government, what we are saying, but in, in none of your reports that is coming very clear. We have interacted with Kauteng. Kauteng was able to tell us what step have they taken. Because still at the end of the day, whether you engage the SIU, the decision still lies with you whether to implement those reports or whatever. But nevertheless, that's one thing that is a concern for members that uh, we can't, we don't see it coming here. Hence, the need for us to continuously engage because you must tell us also what has been your own investigation. Because even when you are to give the SIU a brief, they need to be given a brief based on your own internal investigation 
as the provincial government to say, this is what we feel need to. Because if you just say the SIU must just come and then, uh, then without any particular brief, what is the desired outcome? Then you're going to have a problem. Uh, MEC uh, for health, the issue that I raise about the disaster plans, at least I'm partially covered by Honorable uh, Matam on this matter to say, you need the whole province specific because the things that you are saying you are going to present to us is the EMS uh, response plan. I'm 100% sure about that. And then if you, I will urge you to go and quickly go and check Section 38 of the Disaster Management Act. Uh, for the plan to comply, it must cover epidemics that you are social of. That's what you're talking about, the way you say cholera. That is a, a, a plan for epidemics. Then it must also cover infrastructure. It must also cover emergency medicine. It must also cover EMS. And then uh, the other things, at times you find that hospitals also, also get flooded because there are no measures. The clinical example, you know what happens in Tarazin. So I should think whatever you think is there, but at least you have assured me that uh, you are going to, to, to then uh, share that with us. But then if you can then, uh, I think led by MEC Matam, at the Provincial Disaster Management, there's also a draft that COCTA has developed nationally in response to that Section 38. I should think uh, they also put guidelines with regard to the disaster response management plans, guidelines, development and structures of disaster management plan. So there's a document if you check at the, at the department, uh, the national disaster section site, then you see those things. So this is what we, we, we say when we ask to say uh, yourselves, you must then consider to have a, a, a response plan uh, that's why we've asked what has been the arrangement in this regard, and then which other departments, because all provincial uh, departments, those are, are disaster pro, they must be part of this plan. But I should think it's a matter that, uh, Honorable Makam, you are saying you're going to lead us on this, and then as we, we, we reconvene to meet with you, then you will be able to then take us to confidence of that defense. I should think there was somebody who was trying to raise a hand before I close the meeting. I don't want to be accused of suppressing people. No, Che, we're fine. I seem to have covered you. Yes, Che. With, with, with my closing remarks. And then yeah. at the day, colleagues, uh, when we call you to come to Parliament uh, to account, you all recall that as this committee, we are the lead committee responsible for the Disaster Management Act. And you find us calling all of you to come and account Parliament. Uh, in the mix of everything, uh, like what Honorable Hussein has said, uh, there might think that when they are asked, you think people are asking too much or whatever, but it's in the interest of accountability to our people. And then, you know, like this is the matter that is the issue of PP is, is, is it has become a national issue. That is a matter of concern. So maybe in our future engagement, then the, 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 the province will be able to come and brief us on how are they going to, how have they try to cap matters of this nature and then will await the progress. Uh, because the question was that to you before I close, uh, MEC Makam. Is the premier already uh, appointed or secure to get a proclamation for the SIU to probe these matters? Because that was kind of the report that we wanted to hear from you, which we didn't see to show the commitment that indeed it's a matter that you 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 don't you do, you take seriously. But nevertheless, I think it's the matter as and when you submit the outstanding document to us by the end of the week. If it was done, you'll be able to share with us, or is the matter that you can respond to quickly as one is closing the matter. Yes, uh, the Premier then facilitated the process of getting the SIU to probe these matters as they are like, because this is the issue that the members of the committee also want to know. Or the DG in the 
premier's office can explain that better than you if you are not briefed, MEC. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Honorable Chair. I just want to confirm that uh, the premier is uh, meeting with the SIU tomorrow to discuss this specific matter. Uh, his intention is to make a special request to uh, the SIU through the president uh, or the presidency to actually prioritize these allegations of corruption in Mpopo. And then as soon as the meeting takes place tomorrow, we'll definitely make a, a public pronouncement on the direction accordingly. I thank you. Okay. Any closing remarks, MEC Makam? Thanks, Chairperson, uh, for the opportunity. I think we had a very fruitful discussion with the Portfolio Committee. And thanks to my colleagues, MECs. I personally used to this uh, Portfolio Committee. Uh, I have met with uh, Honorable Hussein, Ukalipi, and the, all of you. So I was used to, but the opportunity which uh, other MECs got today to engage with you, I think it's valuable. I think as we meet tomorrow in our command council, we'll be sharper uh, to be able to deal with issues in terms of the response of COVID. Uh, we just want to say good night to everybody because it's now towards the morning of the command council that we are going to have now. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Chair. <laughs> yeah, we love you. Even ourselves, we have got a committee meeting that's starting not so long, some few hours, and members still need to go and prepare for the meeting. So that's how it works. But I should thank all of you, MEC Bushiello, MEC Ramatuba, MEC Sikwati, thank you, MEC Rafale, DG, and the colleagues uh, from Limpopo. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and, uh, Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, thank uh, you, uh, you all said you are available, don't you? Playing. Polly, you said you are available. You said you are available. But even if we are available, we must leave. I will not take you. You said you are available. Hi, Polly. <laughs> Oh. Bye, MC Makamu. Makamu, Pasikopo. Filimi. Bye, MC Makamu. Oui, Bonnie. Oh, my brother, Jesus. Oh, my brother.